Hello there. In this video, I'm going to show you how I built this real-time stock dashboard in both Vue and React. Now, this app allows you to add multiple symbols, and it reaches out to the Yahoo Finance API and then streams in these stock price updates over WebSockets. And you can add as many symbols as you'd like, and uh, all of the prices stay updated across the page depending on where they're displayed, like here, here, or in the chart, and different things like that. Now, if you're new here, this is the Syntax channel. My name is CJ. I typically do videos that dive deep into technical topics. We also have a podcast that you should check out with Wes and Scott, where they talk about web dev and other tech related things. And uh, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, definitely subscribe. Now, in this video, like I said, I'm going to be comparing Vue and React, and we're going to be talking all about the component hierarchies. So we have a lot of different components here. We have the form, the charts, the stock price info and direction. And I'm going to show you how I structured all of that hierarchy. And then also we'll talk about how we can share this real-time data across our application. Now, this is the fourth video in a multi-part series where I've been comparing the same apps built with both Vue and React. So if you're interested in those, check the link in the description. But let's dive in. My name is CJ. Welcome to Syntax. Now first, let's talk about how this app is broken up into components. So at the top, we have the stocks page itself. Below that, there is a symbol marquee component. So this is the component that allows the latest stock price to scroll across the top. And within that, there is a symbol component. And that is the stock symbol itself, which displays the latest price and direction. And there would be multiple of those in there if there are multiple stocks displayed on the page. Below that, we have the stock symbol form. So this allows you to search for a stock symbol. If it's found, it'll allow you to add it to the page, and then we start to receive real-time updates. Once a stock symbol has been added to the page, we have a line chart component. So this has that same symbol component inside it that displays the latest price and direction, but then below that is a line chart that actually displays the real data in a line chart as it's streamed in. Now, because there are multiple components on the page that all need to receive these real-time updates, I have structured my code to take all of that real-time logic and put it into a separate library. So this is actually completely framework agnostic. I have a little file, I called it Yahoo Finance, and I expose some methods that can be brought into any component to get access to that WebSocket connection and receive those real-time updates. So there is an init method that gets called at the top level to make the initial connection to that WebSocket server. From there, the individual components that need updates can call the subscribe method. So they pass in the stock symbol name and a callback function. And anytime there's a real-time update received over a WebSocket, it calls that callback. So this Yahoo Finance module basically has a list of callbacks that it can invoke with the latest data, and any component can subscribe to that. And then, of course, there's an unsubscribe method as well. So when a component gets unmounted or a stock symbol gets removed, it's going to need to unsubscribe from updates for that specific stock symbol. And then lastly, we have a close method. And so this gets called if the entire page gets unmounted. So we actually disconnect from the WebSocket connection. Now, the reason I've structured it this way is because when you're dealing with real-time data in front-end applications, components mount and unmount and render and re-render a lot. And so if you were to try to hold this connection within the component hierarchy itself, it could get very fragile, could get very hard to manage. And so this is a technique I've used a lot, which essentially takes all the things that have nothing to do with the component library and abstracts them out into their own module. And so this is just JavaScript. This could literally be used in any application. But now that I have it structured that way, I can start to hook up my components to use these methods and basically bring in that functionality to really any sort of front-end framework. So first, let's take a look at the top level and see how that stocks page calls that init method in both Vue and React. So here in React, we have our stocks page. And this component has a list of all the stock symbols that we want to display on the page, and it keeps track of that. So it adds and removes from this state variable, but then that list gets passed down to the marquee component so it can display all of the latest prices across the top. And then we iterate over this list to display a line chart for each one of them. Now, in order to initialize the connection to our WebSocket API, we have a use effect. And so a use effect with an empty dependency array will get called once when the component gets mounted. So essentially, when we navigate to this page, we want to connect to that WebSocket server. So inside of here, I have Yahoo Finance dot init. So under the hood, this is connecting to that WebSocket API. And then if we ever navigate away from this page, we need to disconnect that WebSocket. So we're calling Yahoo Finance dot close. Now here inside of view, we have our stocks page. We have a list of strings that are the symbols and we're using ref. So this is our state variable here inside of view. And then in order to initialize that connection to the WebSocket API, we're using the on mounted lifecycle method that comes from Vue.js. So this is a built-in, you can call it in any component. 
and this will get called once when the component is mounted. And so inside of here, I have the call to yahoofinance.init. Now, when we navigate away from this page, we want to disconnect. So inside of view, we have an on unmounted lifecycle hook, and we can pass in a callback here. And so whenever this component is unmounted, it will disconnect from the WebSocket connection. Now, I've talked about this in previous videos, but there is a caveat of using use effect inside of React if you are in strict mode. So our app is wrapped here in strict mode, and essentially that will show us errors early in development, but it does a thing where it mounts and then unmounts your components in order for you to be able to catch bugs to make sure that you're disposing of things in the right way. But the one issue with that is when I'm in development, it is constantly connecting and then disconnecting from the WebSocket connection. So here inside of React, if I refresh the page, you can actually see that we get an error in the console. Uh, Firefox can't establish a connection to the server, and then the connection was interrupted. Now, we don't get that inside of Vue.js because our on-mounted function is only called once. And essentially what's happening in React is it's calling connect and then disconnect in quick succession, and so that kind of like interrupts the connection. Now, after the page has loaded, we're good to go. Things still work, <laughs> but this is one thing that's pretty annoying. And one way to fix it is to not call init if the component is mounted and then unmounted really quick. And so we can do that using a set timeout. So here, when the component is mounted, we create a timeout that will call init. But then if the component is unmounted, we clear that timeout. And essentially, if this component is mounted and then unmounted in quick succession, it will not call init on the first time. And so if we do this inside of our React app, now we won't see that the connection was interrupted because it won't call connect until the component is officially mounted. Now, you don't necessarily have to worry about this because it is just when we're in development, but it is very annoying to see that connection error when we're in development. So I would write the code this way just to make sure that we don't see that. And then we're not overloading their socket API by constantly trying to connect and then disconnect while we're in development. Now in Vue, we don't have to worry about this because these lifecycle methods on mounted and on unmounted only get called when the component gets mounted or unmounted. All of this code that we have written in the script runs once when the component is created. So there's not a similar thing, whereas in React, that use effect gets called on every render, but it knows not to reinvoke its method if the dependency array hasn't changed. In view, we don't have to worry about that. Essentially, we just pass in our function to on mounted, on unmounted. There's no extra calls that are going to happen that are outside of our control. Now, if we want to add a new stock symbol to the page, we have our symbol form. And like I showed, the list of stock symbols is stored at the top level. So essentially, we need to pass down a method to the symbol form that it can call to add that stock symbol if it's valid and if it should be added to the page. So here inside of React, you can see we have an add symbol method. This essentially just takes in that stock symbol and puts it on the end of the array. And then we're passing down the list of symbols and the add symbol method. Now to work with these props on this component in a type safe way, I've defined a type called symbol form props that has those two things, the list of stock symbols and method, and I can pull them in here. And so now they're type safe and I can use them inside of my component. Now inside of view, we have our add symbol method. And because our refs inside of view can be mutated, we can actually just push directly into that array. We don't need to spread and make a copy of the array. You can see to pass down props to that symbol form, I'm passing that list of symbols and then I'm passing the add method. Now we're seeing some view specific syntax here. Essentially inside of view, if you see this colon, that means we're binding that to a specific variable. So without the colon, it's just an HTML attribute. You can see it comes across as a string, but with that colon, that means I'm explicitly passing down that list of symbols. Uh, the other thing is you can see this at sign here. So if a component exposes a prop that has the on word on it, so like in this case, it exposes a prop called on add, we can actually use the at shorthand. You can see whenever I hover over it, it actually is on add. Uh, but without the shorthand, I would have to type it out like this. Uh, but it's nice that if your components specifically are exposing methods and they follow the on naming, you can just use the at sign syntax to bind the method to that specific prop. Now here inside the symbol form component, we can use the defined props macro. This accepts a type and then we can use those props in a type safe way inside of our component by destructuring from defined props. Now the submission logic for the form needs to take care of a few things. If a user types in something that is not a valid symbol, we should see an error. So essentially when the user types something in, we reach out to the Yahoo Finance API we verify that this is a valid stock symbol. If it's not, we set an error. But if we get back a valid stock symbol, then we make sure it's not in the list and we can call that on add method. So here inside of React, we have our on submit function. You can see we have a few state variables to keep track of the error and whether or not it's loading. And essentially we need to handle all that logic that I just showed you. So grab what the user just entered into that input box, make sure it's not already on the page, set loading to true, reach out to the API to see if this is a valid stock symbol, 
If it's not, set the error. If it was, call the add method, reset the form, and then focus that input. So one thing is after someone types in a stock symbol, I want to be able to type in another one right after that. So you'll notice after I type in Microsoft, I can still type into that input box, and that's because we're focusing it after resetting the form. Now here inside of view, we also have an error state variable and a loading variable, and our handle submit function is almost exactly the same, except we're using the reactive variables instead of using the set methods. But you'll notice again, we call form reset, and then after that, we focus the input. Now in order to focus this input, you might have noticed in the React example, we use set timeout. So there's nothing built into React to essentially say, run this code, after everything has settled, right? After all the state updates have been made, after the DOM has been updated, that's when we want to focus the input. So in this case, we're using set timeout. Essentially, that adds it into the event queue. And then after everything has settled, this function will fire off and focus the input because we are storing a ref to that specific DOM element. So in React, we have this hook called use ref, and we can use this to get a reference to the underlying DOM element. So you'll notice on the input here, we pass in a function to the ref prop, and we can set the current value of that ref. So essentially, React is updating the DOM behind the scenes, and we need to get access to that actual DOM node. So that's what we're using the ref for. And so here you can see that I'm making sure that it actually exists. And if it does, I call focus. And the reason we're using set timeout here is because it's possible that on a previous render, the current value isn't the latest value. So that's why I'm essentially queuing this to be called after everything has settled and been updated. Now inside of view, they have a built-in method for this. It's called next tick. And essentially you pass a callback and you are guaranteed that that method will be called after everything has settled, after the DOM has been updated, after all your state variables have been updated and things like that. Now, to store a ref inside of view, we can just use the same ref that we use for state variables and then pass it into the ref prop on an input. And under the hood, that's going to set the value of that ref. So at this point, after the user has added a stock symbol to that list, it's going to appear on the page because we're passing down that list to the symbol marquee, which is going to create a symbol component for each one. And then we're iterating over that list in the page to show a line chart for each one. Now, when each of those components mounts, it's going to call subscribe via the Yahoo Finance API. So it's gonna pass in that specific stock symbol and a callback function that'll get called anytime there is a real-time update. So first here in React, you can see we have this symbol marquee component and we're just passing down that list of symbols. Inside the marquee component, we've received the symbols as a prop and then we just iterate over them to show a symbol component. Now the symbol component actually displays the stock symbol name, the latest price, and then the direction of the price. Is it going up, down, or staying the same? So this is the symbol component. It exists there inside the marquee, and then it's also going to exist on each of the line charts as well. And there's one symbol component for every stock symbol that's been added to the page. Now inside this component, we have two state variables. We have the stock itself, which is the latest update that we've received from the WebSocket API. And then we have the current direction that the stock is going. Is it going up, down, or staying the same? Now, when this component mounts, we want to subscribe to updates for this specific stock symbol. So in React here, we're using a use effect. You can see that we're passing in two dependencies, the symbol itself and then our on update method. And so when this component mounts, we want to subscribe to updates for that specific symbol. And when it unmounts, we want to call unsubscribe. Now, in this case, we're passing that on update method. And in order to subscribe and unsubscribe, I need to pass the same reference to that function, right? Because later on, when I call unsubscribe, on update needs to be the exact function that's been passed to that library to make sure that it actually gets unsubscribed and, and it stops being invoked. So in React, we use use callback to basically cache this method here because we're passing in an array of no dependencies. So the value that we get back here is always going to be the same. So when we subscribe and unsubscribe, we're always passing in the same reference to that function. Now inside of view, you can see I also have a simple marquee component and I'm passing down that list of stock symbols. Inside the marquee component, I am iterating iterating over that list of stock symbols to create a symbol component. Now you'll notice in this example, when I'm using define props, I'm not actually destructuring it or putting it into a variable because by default, if I don't need access to those props inside of my script here, I can just reference them inside of the template and I'll have access to them because this is a compiler macro. You'll notice that I'm not importing this from anywhere. Essentially, whenever our code gets built, this is all going to be replaced with the correct code for actually pulling in those props and making sure that that prop variable exists inside this component. Now, inside the symbol component, you can see I have two state variables. I've got the latest stock update. So this is the latest update that we've received from the WebSocket API. And then I also have the direction, which starts off as none. Now, the props in this case are just the stock symbol, which is a string. So I'm destructuring that from our define props macro. 
And then when this component mounts, we want to subscribe via the Yahoo Finance API. So when it mounts, we say Yahoo Finance that subscribe, pass in that symbol and the reference to our on update function. And then when the component unmounts, we want to unsubscribe. So we do the exact same thing. Now in this example, because this code inside of Vue.js only runs once, the reference to our on update function stays the same, right? I can pass it in in both places and it's the same reference to the function. Whereas in React, we had to use use callback to make sure that we're caching that value. So on subsequent renders, we still have access to the original value that we specified there. Now let's take a look at that on update function inside of React. So this callback receives the latest update via the WebSocket API. So it's gonna call this function, pass in the latest value, and then we can do what we would like with it. So in this case, when we receive an update, we wanna set latest on our state here. So we're calling set latest, but we also need to keep track of the direction. So we have the latest value, which we just received via the WebSocket API, and then the current state value. And so essentially we can compare those two to determine what the direction is. Now, if the price hasn't changed at all, we just leave the latest stock value as it is. But if it has changed, we calculate, did it go up, did it go down? And then we set the direction as well. Now inside of view is very similar. Check to see if the price has changed. And if it has, we'll get the direction that the price is going update the direction value and update the latest value. The major difference here is we're not calling our setter functions. We can just modify those state variables directly. Now, finally, we can talk about the line chart component itself. Now, just like the symbol component calls the subscribe method to get updated about the latest stock value, the line chart does this as well, except it needs to keep track of the history of values so that it can display that line chart. So I showed you the symbol component first. So you can see the basics of subscribing, but now let's take a look at line chart where things are a little bit more complex. So here in React inside the stocks page, we're going to iterate over that list of symbols to render out a line chart. Now we pass down a color, which we just fixed to a static value. We pass down the stock symbol itself, and then we pass down a remove method. So whenever we click that remove button on the line chart, it's able to call up to the page and actually remove it from the list of symbols. Now in this case, to remove it from the list, I'm calling the filter method. So we pull that stock symbol out. Once it's removed from the list, it won't show up in the marquee anymore because we're passing down that list and the line chart itself won't exist either. We take a look at view, similar idea. We are iterating over that list of stock symbols, passing in a static color and passing in the stock symbol itself. Now, just like earlier, the prop here is called on remove. So we can use that at sign for at remove and we pass in remove symbol. Now for the remove symbol function, technically we could just splice the value from the array because we're able to modify it, but the code is simpler for us to just filter out that value and replace the entire array. So let's take a look at the stock line chart component here inside of react. So first we have our props. We're taking in that color, that stock symbol string, and then a removal function. We have two state variables, the direction that the stock is moving, and then also the stock info itself. So stock info is a custom type that keeps track of the latest stock info, and then all of the information that we need to actually render out the chart. So we have a list of labels. So those are the labels along the X axis, which are the time for each of those stock updates. And then we have the data set. Now for this example, I'm using chart.js. So I've pulled in their types to describe this data set, which is for a line chart. Now, when the component mounts, we need to subscribe for updates on that specific stock symbol. So this is just like the symbol component where on mount subscribe for those specific updates. And then when we unmount unsubscribe, and you'll notice we had to use use callback as well to make sure that we always have the same reference to that on update function. Now, if we look at the stock line chart here inside of view, we can see we have those same three props, color, symbol, and on remove. And we have two state variables, direction and the latest stock info. Now we also have a data variable, which is the data we're passing down to the chart. I'll talk about why we need a separate state variable here in view in a second. Uh, but just like the symbol component on mounted, we want to subscribe to updates for that specific stock symbol. And when it's unmounted, we want to unsubscribe. Now, if we take a look at the render function here inside of React, you can see that I'm bringing in this line component. And this line component comes from React Chart.js 2. So I'm using Chart.js in both examples, but I've found a third party library that wraps Chart.js to work with both Vue and React. So in the case of React, we're using React Chart.js 2, and they expose some components for us. So that way we can literally just pass down our options and our data, and it'll render out the chart for us. Now, in the Vue example, we also have a line component in this line component is coming from view chart JS and the props are exactly the same. We pass down the options and also pass down the data. And that library specifically is called view chart JS. So both of these are just simple component wrappers on top of chart JS. 
Now, the heavy lifting for this stock line chart component is this on update method. So every time we get an update of data via that WebSocket API, we need to add it onto our state here. And essentially, we're creating an object that has both labels and data set because this is the data that we need to pass down to that chart component. And so we can take a look here in React at our on update function. So anytime we receive a stock update, we want to update the info that we have stored on state here, which essentially keeps track of the history of values for that specific stock. Now inside of here, we set the direction based on where the stock is moving. And if we have not seen that stock before, we need to create a brand new stock info object with all of the default values. And so that's what I'm passing in here. So I created this helper function called update stock info, which takes the previous value and the next value and then kind of combines them together. So in the case where this is the first update that we're receiving, we need to create an initial object here. So it has the stock ID, the latest value, and then all of the options for our data set. And so you can see this is how I'm specifying the style and then also the color that got passed down from the parent. Now, update stock info basically combines this with our latest values update. So let's take a look at that function. So we take in the current stock info and the update that needs to be applied to it. Now, the WebSocket API has constant updates, and sometimes they include the exact same timestamp. So we don't want to put those into our history unless it's a unique timestamp. So the first thing I do is create a label based on the time of this specific stock update, and then make sure that we haven't seen that label before. And if we have seen it before, we just don't make the update. So essentially, we'll be receiving these socket updates for the same price at the same time, Ignore those, but then when we see a new time, we'll actually add it to our list of labels in our data set. So down here, you can see that I spread the previous list of labels, add the new label onto the end. I spread all of our existing data set options, spread all of our existing data points, and then add a data point for this specific update that just happened. So this helper method is super useful because I can use it on the initial call with the initial value of our stock. And then on subsequent updates, I can just call that function and, and I don't have duplicate logic. Now, you might have noticed down below, I have an ESLint ignore here. And this is because whenever you're specifying a dependency array, if you have ESLint installed, enabled, and you have the right rule enabled, and so this will actually warn you if you don't pass in all of the dependencies that are being used by this use effect. And so you can see right here, it has a missing dependency color. Now, I know that the color prop is not going to change. It's always going to be the same one that was passed in. And I don't want this update function to get recreated. So I'm basically just ignoring that rule and saying, hey, I, I know I'm always going to use the initial value that was passed into this component. So no need to track that dependency. So let's see how the on update function works here inside of Vue.js. So when we receive that WebSocket update, we're first going to grab the label that we're going to use to pass into our chart data. And if we have not gotten an update before, essentially this is the first update we're getting from the WebSocket API, we're just gonna create some initial options. And so this is a helper function, very similar to the last one I showed you, but this is for creating those initial options. So you can see, I'm just creating my options that need to be passed into the chart here. And the one thing you will notice is for data, I'm actually using mark raw. Now, this is typically not something I have to reach for whenever using Vue, but sometimes when you're interfacing with a third-party library, they don't work very well with reactive variables. And because our info variable here is a ref, which means it's a reactive variable, this data property is also reactive because it's, it's deeply reactive. And when we pass this to the underlying chart library, it doesn't know what to do with all those extra props that are basically there for keeping track of reactivity. So for this specific example, I'm saying mark raw, which means this nested prop here will not be a reactive variable. So that way there's not all the extra properties on top of it. And I have some code that will have the latest value itself. So the underlying component can still get those state updates without this actually being a reactive variable. So that sets the initial value. And then we have our data property, which we're actually passing down to our line chart. Now, because Vue.js specifically works off of reactive variables, this is why I had to define data as a separate reactive variable. So I have my data defined here. If I were to pass this data directly down to the prop here, it wouldn't actually receive the updates because this render function doesn't get called over and over again like it does in React. It's only going to get called specifically if this data has changed. So in order for the latest values to be passed down to that line chart to actually see those line chart updates, we have a separate reactive value that I'm just overriding anytime we get some new data. If you contrast that with how we're doing it in React, we are just directly passing down the data here. And that's because this render function is going to run every time we have a state update. So it's always going to be passing the latest data down to that component. Now, if this is not the initial update from the WebSocket API, we'll actually update the existing data that we have here 
in our component. And so here, if we have seen that label already, we don't do anything because that means the current update has the exact same timestamp of one that we've already seen. But if not, we can just update our state variables. So we update the direction, set the latest value, and then we can push in the latest label and the value for our data set there. And so that's pretty much it. Essentially, this component is just sitting here waiting for these updates. Once it receives new data, it updates the labels and the data set. And then the underlying line chart receives that latest data and shows the updates on the page. Now, my least favorite part of the React example is that I have to manually opt out of uh, the dependency tracking here to make sure that my linter isn't yelling at me. And these state updates are immutable updates. And this is just how React works. It works off of immutable data. But you can notice here that we have some deeply nested data that we're having to spread. Now, there are libraries you could reach for that would make these state updates a little bit better, but these are deeply nested state updates. So every single array that has a new value, I need to spread the previous one. And every object that I'm updating, I need to spread the previous one as well. So this is pretty cumbersome that we do have to do that immutable update here. Now, in the view example, I like that we don't have to have a use callback here for on update, right? I can just define my function. I don't have to do anything special with it. And then when I'm updating my data set, I don't have to have that immutable update. But I did actually have to reach for some things that a lot of view developers might not know about, like this mark raw function. And I had to keep my data in a separate variable here in order for the line chart here to see those latest changes. So what are some final takeaways here? Ultimately, the implementation of both is fairly similar. And that's probably because I wrote it. <laughs> and uh, I actually went through multiple iterations and refactoring to kind of like get the code in the best place that I thought it could be. Um, but probably the, the most cumbersome thing about working in the React example is with all of these use effects and also use callbacks, make sure that things don't get called over and over again, and also make sure that we're always using the same reference like with use callback. Now, a lot of the heavy lifting was actually done by extracting a lot of this socket management log logic into a separate module, right? I didn't have to do it directly inside of React or directly inside of Vue. And in this example, I pretty much did that so that we could have a closer implementation to compare and contrast. But I have worked in React code bases that are dealing with real time, and they try to handle everything directly inside the component, and that gets even messier. You have more use effects, more use callbacks, and it's a lot to work with. Now, for this example, I purposefully didn't use a global state management solution like I did in the second video in this series, because I really wanted to isolate showing you like component hierarchies and then also like how do we work with external libraries and async data. But I want you to imagine a code base that kind of takes all of the things that I've done in all of the examples, like global state management, local state management, uh, async requests, component hierarchies, and then combine them together in your mind, because that's closer to what you'll be working with in the real world. It's not gonna be these little isolated examples like I showed you. It's going to be much more complex and combined together. And in my experience, that's when things really start to break down. That's when your application logic gets really complex. You have multiple use effects. You have context being used all throughout your application. And ultimately the code base becomes very complex. And so if you take away anything from this video or the other videos in the series, I just want you to see how in a somewhat simple example, how things start to snowball, how we have use effect on top of use effect on top of use callback. And in larger code bases written with React, this stuff starts to get out of hand fairly quickly. Now in the view examples, the biggest thing that stands out to me is just how nice compartmentalized and labeled everything is, right? We don't have just a single method use effect for everything. We have specific methods to do the things we wanna do like on mounted or on unmounted or watch or watch effect or things that, that have a specific name that are gonna do that one thing. And also, we don't have to worry about the code at the top of our component running over and over again. It runs once on create, so we don't have to memoize function references or, or variable references. Now, another takeaway you could potentially get from this video that is has nothing to do with Vue or React is the idea of abstracting out some of that business logic so it doesn't live inside of your components because at a certain point, it becomes a lot easier to manage, right? I actually haven't showed you the implementation for this Yahoo Finance library. Of course, this is the public API. We have a few methods that we expose, but talking to this WebSocket endpoint um, requires quite a bit of logic. We have to manage the connection. We have to manage the callbacks. And so this was quite a bit of library code that has nothing to do with React or Vue, but it definitely cleaned up the rest of the code base because everything has been abstracted away into this one spot. So that way we don't have to deal with the complexities of WebSockets or, or their API. We just call these methods from within our components and deal with the things that the frameworks are good at, like state updates.
So lastly, I just wanna let you know that this video is brought to you by Sentry. So Sentry is an error monitoring platform that allows you to have some visibility to your code that's running in production. So if you get errors on your backend or in your front end, all of them get reported to the Sentry dashboard and you can have a much better overview of what's happening in the real world and also how to fix those things as well. Sentry has SDKs for all kinds of languages and frameworks. You can add it to your React app, you can add it to your Vue app. So no matter what you're building with, you can use Sentry to help track your errors in production. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions, please throw them down in the comments. And if you haven't seen the other videos in the series, definitely check those out where I dive into the other aspects of building front-end applications with both Vue and React. All right, I'll see you in the next one.